thank you everybody for coming. Yay. Um, really excited to do this talk back because this show has been a lot of fun. Um, not only being the 25th season, 75th show we're opening with, but also in our new home. Um, so it's really awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we uh, welcome to the making of Heather's. Uh, wow, what a trip. When you say, <laughs> I think we'd all say that. Yeah. Um, Rob, I just want to go to you first, and I just talk. I, will you talk about a little bit about the space, and a, in reference to Heather's of how you wanted to use the space? Okay. Um, well, with it being a black box and sort of our first time in the black box in a long time, uh, Scott and I talked. About a lot at length about how can we use this, and I actually came up with about a, I don't know, a half a dozen different ways just to lay out the seating. And uh, and when it was all said and done, I said, you know, let's let's try this L-shaped thing, which creates this really funky, bizarre thing here. <laughs> yes, it um, does. <laughs> but uh, the um, the space with doing this and not having more than about five rows of seats, it really pushes the audience down. If we went to one end and put the seats up, you know, it'd, you'd be eight or ten rows away, and it wouldn't have that same intimacy. With the way the room is laid out, the audience is really pushed into the action. So I think that was really important for this show. Um, when you get down to the pep rally at the end of the show, and the, the uh, cast is seated, and they literally are the same distance away from the front row that the subsequent rows are, the rest of the audience become part of the pep rally. The bombs are under the audience, which is pretty right. cool. Yeah. Um, so that's really, uh, so then we had, once we sort of said, well, we're, let's give this a shot and try it, uh, then we pulled the seats off the walls, so we, you know, we had circulation behind there. Um, finally, where we go with the van, and we put them in the corner and put the set in front of it, that's when it sort of created this weird triangle dynamic space to play in, um, which sort of creates tension just in its nature. So. Did you start developing the idea when you were actually building the physical space at the Marcel, like when you were in here and I, the, the, seeing it grow? The half a dozen different, uh, different layouts came as I was developing a plan for the facility. Because, well, like anything, you have to you have to be able to, to see in your mind how it might work, even if it never really, Scott actually used a Sondheim quote. Uh, Sondheim says, has said, every time he writes a piece of music, he stages it in his head, uh, even if it's never staged that way, in, you know, in the future, in real life, he has to know that it's stageable. So when this space was designed, yes, by the time we got done placing the doors where they were, and knowing how the rest of the space sort of flowed, I had to know that that would work. And so I guess we took sort of one of the most unusual or interesting layouts and tried it for the very first one. Right. And so now, for picking a show, Scott, not knowing really, except on paper, how your new space is going to be, is that scary to pick a show and not know what you're going to be working in? Uh, no. No, because we, we, you know, we went through the show and I had no idea how we were going to stage it right. <laughs> until I got the drawing from Rob. Uh, and, I, and I have to say, you know, he sent me this drawing and we talked about it uh, on the phone quite a bit. Um, I signed off and I was like, this is awesome, this is awesome. And then we started blocking and Jesus, God, was it hard to block on a triangle. Um, and so I called Rob at some point and said, all right, I'm blogging about how hard this is, don't take it personally. Um, but but you know if 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 an actor is up here in front of the platform, they essentially have to play 180 degrees. If they're down here, they got to play like 270 degrees. Yeah. So uh, as I'm sure you remember, we spent the whole rehearsal process yelling at our actors, share, share, sidelines. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, we figured it out. We figured out how to do something on a triangle, and I think it turned out really cool. Well, and I know during rehearsals, and probably for some of the actors, it was hard to see for me especially in that rehearsal space trying to see what the layout really was and I was like, I don't know if this is working and the things that you would even mention be like, I don't know if this is gonna work and think I don't know if this is working and then we move in and it is all working. Well and the 
then there's other stuff that wasn't. One big mistake that I made that I now know, except I'm never doing another triangle. Um, <laughs> what we learned was that in the rehearsal hall, we treated this corner here where the two sections meet, we treated that as down center. And that was in the front and middle of our rehearsal room. Um, and that was a terrible idea because actors love down center. And so the actors were playing down center, which was playing out to an empty aisle, um, and were constantly trying to redirect them. You know, um, once we got in here, it, that wasn't down center. It doesn't feel like down center. Nobody thinks it's down center. Yeah. And if we hadn't done that in rehearsal, I think it might have been a little easier on the actors, picturing <laughs> what this thing was going to end up looking like. Because there isn't a down. I mean, if anything, down center is like around here somewhere. You know? Right. But, so, but that's what creates the tension on the stage. You know, yeah. Staging. There is no center. There, there is no prime spot to sit in the audience. Right. You are just sort of gathered around this action that's going on. Yeah. It's a whole different idea, it's which is cool. what Black Box is about. And, and if you're you know, at all on the sides, you have audience as background to the action, which is also really cool. It's like being in a cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's kind of a thrust. You have to treat it like a thrust. Yeah, but you it's don't sort get a of three-part round. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't get a center section like you do right. with a traditional thrust to the stage. Right. You know? But and the other thing we did, which I think was done once or twice before, but it was really helpful, was the first night in the space, we spent a lot of time just walking through and spacing. And we had you and me and Jeremy in various places around the house, and we'd say, you know, I, I can't see so-and-so, I can't see so-and-so, yeah. and you know, kind of adjust everything. And I think that made everything easier after that. Right. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, now, with how the set is placed and everything, I'm gonna to go to Ben now, because I just wanna know, is this configuration for you, and with this set, was it difficult to try to get a blended sound? Uh, yeah, Vince, definitely. Or? I mean, if you look at where the speakers are placed, it's not really, you know, uh, symmetrical on both sides, but it can't be with this L shape, you know? Right. So you kinda of just have to make do with what you can do. Um, I just tried to get as much coverage as I could, you know, to the areas that needed it. And, uh, I mean, I would have liked them to be a little bit more symmetrical, I guess, if that <laughs> were to be possible, but I don't think it would have been um, without having them be a really awkward and um, kind of sight-grabbing places, you know. I need them to be inconspicuous, right. so. Right, well, it's, it sounds great. I, 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 I would ask that a question. I, I, I've always wanted to ask this question. How awful is it to have 16 actors all with body mics? Because <laughs> yeah. uh, we do that a lot. It's definitely a nuisance. I mean, as I'm sure all the actors can attest to, there's at least one person who's not working at some point throughout the night. And, you know, in the case of our last performance, we had one that just, like, outright did not work at all. So, you know, um, it's definitely a lot. What's my face? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah that's, that's definitely the know the flip side to it is that with this space you can kind of get by without a lot of sonic reinforcement so even when it's there it's not like I'm you know cranking it super loud or anything like that so um, yeah but it has definitely been a hassle just with I mean it's a lot to keep track of but you never get your hands off the soundboard all that no <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm always yeah. adjusting people especially with how many scenes there are where there's a lot of face-to-face uh, -face interaction going on stuff you've got multiple actors going into the same mics and stuff like that, and so you just have to kind of keep an eye out for stuff like that and just note where everyone's at on stage. Was it a total, like, I don't know, uh, like learning curve, like, oh my god, this is absolutely frustrating to be in a space that's way smaller than this? Like, the sound <laughs> counts. Obviously it, was, it does, because I'm not... Yeah, it was, it, it took a little getting adjusted, too. I think the first night here I had, like, a few instances where it just started feeding back really bad because you know you'll have people walking directly in front of the monitors with you know how it is but that's where they have to be so it's like you just have to get used to that and kind of again be aware of where people are at and just kind of adjust for that but that I think that was the biggest uh, problem that I faced with this space is just like getting used to how intimate it is and how easily the sound can carry in this space how many times did Scott yell at the band for being too loud? <laughs> really? A few times. Which night? <laughs> <laughs> no, because Rob keeps building sets that baffle the band sound a little. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I 
figured because it's so <laughs> tight in here, like it's, I don't know, it seems so. That's it. A lot of audience really. were raving about sound balance. Well, awesome. A lot right. of people were saying sound balance. It's, it's awesome. Know, the space, just the way it's created, uh, is a crisp space. Mm -hmm. You can hear it just sitting here talking to right. each other. Mm -hmm. You can hear the crispness of the room. And it's not echoey, it's not gymnasium like, awesome. but it's, you can really understand, and that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really does, especially when you have the actors behind the seat so singing, good. and you're like, that's it's so good. good. <laughs> it's so really crazy. Um, so for Gabe, for you, mm -hmm. is, was there anything in this show that was challenging for you? With Was it weird being not in a in an glass booth? Yeah. Cool <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't get to talk about audience members as much, which is really sad. Uh, <laughs> we, you know, we, we have some characters here. Um, but mostly yeah, we all like to sing the booth sometimes. And we all like to sing the booth. There's sure. some dancing that we've noticed <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Uh, with a big thing with staging, as we talked about, the, the blocking for this was, it takes so much getting used to, especially trying to do shorthand as we're going through blocking rehearsals and trying to pick up as much as we possibly can. When there's no down center to reference, you just start making things up and, oh, he's slightly downstage of the big round thing. And then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but other than that, I think moving into the space really helped and really helped the actors get acclimated, which was a cool thing to see. Yeah, and lighting as well. You run the light board. I do. Uh, and in this one, the hardest thing is not watching the actors because they're all really interesting in this show. Yeah. Not to say that they're not other shows, but this one, there's a lot of storytelling going on and it's very easy to get distracted by the actual story. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I normally start with this question, but I thought I'd switch it up a little bit. And Scott, I do want to know what about the show? Why did you pick it? What 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 wanted? Why did you want to do that story? The, the, these writers have been developing the show for I don't know, like a long time, six eight years, maybe longer. Um, and from the moment I heard about it, I thought, oh my god, that's awesome! A Heather's musical because I love the movie. I've always loved the movie. Um, and, and uh, it's written by Larry O'Keefe, who did Bat Boy, which I think is a masterpiece, uh, and Legally Blonde, and then the other writer is Kevin Murphy, who did Reaper Madness. So we've, we've done both Bat Boy and Reaper Madness. I was delighted. Um, but it kept not going anywhere. You know, they do a reading or they do a small production or whatever, and nothing else would happen. And I'd think, okay, well, it must suck. Um, but, you know, as we've now learned, <laughs> shows that don't do well don't necessarily suck. They just may not be treated well. Right. Um, and I think they kept rewriting a lot over time. Uh, eventually, uh, Samuel French, the licensing agency, uh, emailed us and said, we, uh, well, it opened off Broadway, it did not do well. And then Samuel French emailed us and said, do you want, you know, we're going to get rights, do you want the rights? And I was like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, and I think at that point the cast album had come out, so we had heard it. Um, and I just thought it was incredible, like, so incredibly strong and well written. Sophisticated and smart and and really damn edgy, which I love. Um, yes, we snatched it up, and and at the time we didn't know it would be the first show in the new theater, but uh, but that turned out really cool too. Yeah. Um, so I don't think we're the first ones in the country to do it, but we're definitely the first ones in the region to do it. Um, but a ton of people are doing it now, even as we're still running. A lot of other productions have opened around the country, so I think people were really waiting for this yeah. and really excited. And, and, and I have to say, um, as much as I love the movie, the show is darker and it's more serious. Um, and I think that's because we get interior monologues. We get people, we get characters just telling us what they think and feel. And I think that gives them a lot of extra weight, uh, particularly in Act Two. Um, but I think we go, we go to a kind of seriousness that the movie doesn't ever get to, really, which is kind of cool. Yeah. It's really and we got this killer cat. so palpably Yay. 80s. It's <laughs> sad because it doesn't, it's not as 
80s as I want it, like the actual stuff isn't as 80s as I want it to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's really hard nowadays to go, like, because obviously for the show I had to shop a lot for it because I don't have to make anything for this one. Um, it looks better if you don't. But it's really hard to go, like, thrifting and find real good actual 80s pieces uh, because people have started collecting them for, look at my tacky ironic parties, and um, <laughs> actual like vintage stores have started swiping oh, like because 80s stuff, yeah, 80s stuff yeah. is actually being swiped up and put into vintage stores and stuff, yeah. so it's Old. really hard. That sweater that Martha has is like the crown jewel, in my opinion, because yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. it's got the shoulder pads and the fringe and the just the people wore that. Um, <laughs> and that's one that we could sell and we could make some money for New Line because yeah. it's just perfect. It's so perfect. Um, but it uh, trying to find the real actual 80s stuff and then blending it with, with things that you can actually wear on stage and stuff that will fall apart, which the cats has a problem with things falling apart, their pants. Yeah. <laughs> Do you not have a record for split pants? There are sure. like four people split their pants. I have like prepared six to five. Six 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 five. Six yeah. A lot of these are personal pants, right? Mm -hmm. No. Well, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> if there's any more broken pants in the show, I need to know. Um, <laughs> I will fix them. But uh, <laughs> it is, it, it was really exciting and a challenge to be able to do it because it's, that's my favorite movie. Um, this, Heather's is my favorite movie. And so this was one of those like, dream come true, started picking out outfits for the actual Heathers, I don't know, six months ago. I don't know who's going to be wearing these clothes, but in my head I have them picked out <laughs> yeah. what I want and how they're going to happen, and everything just kind of fell into place perfectly. They're just, I would go out and find stuff, and it would be like, that's exactly what I need, that sweater, that's what I need, this sweater vest is a perfect sweater vest. It just, everything kept falling into place, and everybody looks... So good. Was, uh, so good. How much was color an issue? Was, was it hard to find these colors, or is that not such a big deal? Um, I brought the color swatches with me, and I from had a hot from the set, and I was having a hard time finding some of the colors for the set. But when I just kind of let it go and let it play with it, because at first I was really trying to stick with like so and so is yellow, they must be yellow, and trying to match shades is stupid. So just let it explode and vomit everywhere, <laughs> like the 80s did. Well, exactly, and that's what I love about it. I love that it didn't necessarily exactly match the set, and to where it was still, nobody blended in, but they always popped out, mm -hmm. even though against this bright mm -hmm. and light. Well, that was a, I was afraid of losing people again. Right. When Rob was giving me this like turquoise and yellow, I'm going, oh no, I'm going to put people in. But I think everybody's managed to play on that. And I managed to find Letterman jackets that actually are the school colors. Yeah. So um, I feel good. I feel good. I feel good about it. A little costume compliment. I, I think what's cool about it is that it is undeniably, unmistakably the 80s, but there's no costume that's a joke. Oh, good. You know, there's no costume you're like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's like you, 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 I think we do get giggles sometimes mm -hmm. because it's so right. Like, it's just yeah. like hilarious how right it is. But there are no jokes in the costumes, and I, that's so important for me for this show particularly. Well, if you're not gonna have jokes in the show, if you're not gonna, if the show is is taken as seriously that it needs yeah. to be. Now I did throw a mullet wig in there, but we all know people who have had which is off, but again, it's not, it, that doesn't feel <laughs> mullets were real. Like we're trying to get a laugh from it. It feels like oh Jesus, the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what about what sizes? Do what? The sizes. You would buy a particular piece of clothing. How did you match it to the person? Well. Uh, 80s clothes, fortunately, um, are shaped weird. Well, unfortunately, are shaped weird. Um, they're either baggy or they're like narrow in weird places. Um, so they would be bigger in the shoulders. Bigger in the shoulders, the add the shoulder pads. And, uh, fortunately, a lot of the stuff, um, I do all my measuring and I measure things to the people. So if I see something that I like, I, oh, these pants look great. You wouldn't have known six months ago who was going to be it. I didn't actually pick out, pick out. But like, like some people, like I did some looking up on like Facebook, like Larissa, I had started buying things because I had just costumed her previous. Sure. Um, and Kamisha, I just like I looked at her Facebook profile and was like, I don't know, I just don't buy it big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to get some stuff for people that I worked with before. Um, Anna, uh, who's Veronica, I was able to. I actually found a dress for her, I want to say when I was shopping for Three Penny Opera, because I found
found this dress and it was like, that is an adorable dress. That's gonna look really cute on Anna, that black and white dress that she has. It's like, it's gonna look really cute on her. She is going to want to keep this <laughs> when the show is done. And sure enough, I had her try, I tried it on first thinking I was going to keep it for myself. And, that was <laughs> and then she tried it on and was like, you're probably not gonna get this dress, but yeah, I'm probably not gonna get it. You can have it, it looks really well with you. So it's a lot of it, some of it's working with the people that I've worked with before to know what they, what sizes and stuff work. I know. so many new faces here. Yeah, that t that part was tough. Yeah, more than half the cast is new this time. We relied awesome. a lot on measurements for that one. And it shows when you get the measurements wrong. And you end up with something that you're like, this is your size. Oh, you and seven friends. I'm so sorry. Let's <laughs> 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 take it back and return it. Well, one of my favorite costumes in the show, or one of my favorite moments, is uh, Speaking of Kamisha, later on, after she's been... Oh, she rises in She the rises to the top as main okay. bitch Heather. <laughs> and then after you see her do that, she starts wearing red, which is who, what Heather Chandler wore. But, but not as much red, yeah, like subtle red. Right, right, right. You know, but it was still, you saw that. that color change, like you saw that shift in her, and that it really helped... You know, because I remember seeing it at first and being like, well, she's the green one, right? So green should be everyone's new favorite color instead of red. But then it, it made so much Red is the power yeah, color. Exactly. But you know, you know what hit me? Just this past week, seriously watching when she came back out in red, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, she's red now. I thought she was the only one who was a secondary color. Now they're all primary That's true. colors. Oh. <laughs> she's moved from secondary yeah. to primary. Right. Right. No. <laughs> Any questions? While, while we're on the subject of color, there's something I noticed. I don't know if you guys ever noticed it. During Candy Store, um, if you notice, you have this, the Heathers and Chandler, so you have red, yellow, green, and blue. But then you have JD in black, Martha in pink, and us and Curtin Rand in brown in the background. And I don't know, the, the cover, the, the, this, I don't know, the you picture. You are the 12 pack of markers. <laughs> 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 oh, this is really cool. I don't really really notice that. Purple. There's something random. Um, no, I always wanted to add, it's like, obviously, I mean, you, you can see it. The first thing we saw when we saw the design, Rob, was the building blocks. How did you come with that? Well, the 80s uh, in design and in architecture, and if you go back and you look, they're, they're still selling stuff that was designed in the 80s at Target, which is crazy. There's a designer, his name's Michael Graves, and if you go to Target, you'll find Michael Graves' stuff there still. Uh, very popular. What happened was is that Starting in about the 70s or so, there was this rebellion against modernism, you know, sort of the white box modernism. And what designers did was they grabbed these geometric forms and these classical shapes, classical columns, and, and these pure geometries like this, and they sort of slammed them together into, in this plastic design. Uh, so that's why the colors are the way they are. They're all plastic colors. This is all, it's fake. And that's exactly what the 80s was. It was the epitome of fake design. <laughs> uh, and that's where all of this came from. This, this is right out of there. And I have to say, the, the minute I saw the drawing, I thought, that looks like every mall I've seen in the 80s, and all the kinder cares in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, those things, those archetypes are straight out of the 80s. And the other thing we have to remember is that Heather's takes place in 89, it's the end of it. So, it, it, that design had already run its course and we were getting into other things, but this school would have been done a few years oh, before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, so you're living in something that's already aged a little bit, which is, which is why it's set the way it is. Well, it takes place in Ohio, so, you know, they got the 80s after everything else. <laughs> <laughs> St. Louis, St. Louis is just now getting there. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. No, 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 I don't know what you're Um, I was wondering for Scott and Downey, um, what ha, what was it like for you transitioning into a show where most of the cast you've never worked with before? Did it present specific challenges or specific things to be excited about? Well, so most of the time we aim for half new people, half people we've worked with before. Um, 
sometimes it goes one way or the other a little bit more. Um, I think more often, if it's not half, it's more veterans than new people. Um, but there have been a few times, I think rent also was more new yeah, people than old people. Okay. Um, and I, I love it. Um, the only downside to it is that the new people don't know me yet. So when I ask them for something incredibly strange or odd, they're all like, oh, wow. You know, whereas the veterans are all like, I don't get it, but Scott does, so we'll do it. Um, so that, I mean, that's, you know, that's one kind of minor drawback that, that I kind of had to show you all that I sort of knew what I was doing. Um, but but, the, but the, the nice thing about that, you know, basically half and half thing is that the veterans all know how we work. They, they, they know what the weirder aspects of our process are and how to get through them and all that. And then they're there for the new people to go, don't worry, he knows what he's doing. Um, so, so that, you know, that's always nice. And for me, there's nothing better than getting new people in a show because it, it helps us be fresh. You know, it helps us not get in ruts and not get into habits and stuff like that. And so it's, I love it. Right, and he's uh, kind of had, I mean, you've had way more experience than I have of working with, you know, I, I haven't been directing with you long. Um, but for me, it's never, it's always just like, oh, I wonder, I wonder if these, you know, it's always before actually meeting everybody. And really, it's always thinking, I wonder what they can do. I wonder, who did we even pick? I don't even remember. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, after we, you know, it's like after those headshots are out of our hands and we haven't met you yet, it's like, I don't even remember who's what or where or whatever like that. But for me, it's always just, what can they do? Are they going to listen? Are they going to, you know, think we're fucking crazy? <laughs> well, you know? and, and this show, the cast came in knowing a, a fair amount of the music and learning music really quick. People got off book relatively early. Well, and so knowing, like the the music, process, knowing the music coming in, but not constantly trying to mimic right, right, right. what has already been done, which yeah. I appreciate. So thank you. Yeah. No, I mean, part of it was the cast was terrific to work with. Um, and, you know, this isn't a super weird show. It's a slightly weird show. <laughs> um, but everybody seemed to be so on board and so enthusiastic and so psyched about doing Heathers, and, you know, as we were. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it was, for me, it was a pretty great process. Well, that was, you called me one night. Talking about, you called me one night, we were talking about costumes or whatever, and you were like, I just gotta say, everybody just goes for it. Like, yeah. very rarely, especially with that many new people that you've worked with, you were like, everybody just, they just jump right in. They're not worried about it. I'm not ever having to be like, come on, bring more to the top. Let's go, guys. Everybody is like going whole hog on all of it. And yeah. it's, it's, which partly I think was their excitement, in my own opinion, not speaking for you, but was their own excitement of doing the show. But then also, you know, their professionalism of really just, but even when they have, but this says, oh, okay, no, okay, we're doing, we're doing okay, we're doing it. You know, we're doing what you say. You know, we're assume that we will follow stage direction. Right, right. But, yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, can I ask the opposite of that? What is it, what is most difficult about working with veteran actors at the company? The, the number one thing for me is that no matter how strange or odd or confusing a thing I ask for, the people who've already worked with us are like, okay, all right, whatever, say, I guess. And then they just do whatever I ask. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work. You know, sometimes it's a terrible idea, but they try it anyway. Sometimes they know it's not gonna work, but they try it. <laughs> <laughs> that is also true. Yeah. Because if it is a bad idea, I know it right away. 
You know, I don't have to wait for the actors to get better and better and better at it, and then we see that it doesn't work. You know, if they all jump in and just do it, um, it's super helpful. Um, and the other thing is that the when I'm blocking, I don't give the actors a, a, a ton of detail unless it really has to be kind of semi-choreographed. For a lot of scenes, I'll tell the actors where they come in, where they'll be in the scene, and where they leave. And I want them to fill in the other stuff because it'll be more interesting that way. And again, the people who worked with it before are already fine with that and they're cool with it and they love it and they're ready for it. Sometimes the new people are like, what do you mean you're not gonna give me everything I need? You gotta give me everything I need. And they're a little freaked out about it. Um, usually they figure out it's way more fun if the actor's contributing more, you know? Right. Um, but it's that kind of thing that's easier for me with people who know the process, know how I wanna work, know what I wanna see. I mean, I think on the other end of it, of, you know, if using the veterans or whatever, that, you know, uh, yes, we do know all those processes, and sometimes for some of us, it's our third, fourth, fifth, whatever show, kind of in a row. So on the other side, it's like just wondering if there's going to be any frustrations from them of, to where they won't be given it at all from the beginning. It's like you kind of sometimes just have to, like, Come on, give us something. We know you're tired, but come on, or whatever. You know, like stuff like that. But normally, it, it goes away. You know. It, it, well, especially when you work with we people all, like this. Right. Oh like, yeah, exactly. Like if you're in stuff and in stuff and in stuff, and you're like approaching it like it's a slog or something like that, you get burned <coughs> out. Right. But then to come in and see people that are so excited to be doing it, it's like, oh, this is why we're doing it. Right. That makes sense. Again. Right. And that's where I, you know, on the other end of it. I, I am more of a detail oriented and I like the characterizations of things. So I like trying to tap into our actor's character of who they're really trying to portray and, you know, and trying to really tap into that and ask them questions and get them to come out and to bring their character that they want to show out that still lives within the world that Scott's created for us to go into. And that, for me, it really, sometimes it's a lot easier to work with veterans because I know how they work, I know how to relate to them and what questions I can ask that they'll understand as well, to where sometimes with new people, I'm not sure, does that make sense? I'm not, you know, I have to constantly tell you, I'm not telling you what to do, or I don't need an answer to a question, but, you know, and so that, to me, is where it's the balance. And sometimes it's the veterans that I have the hardest time, like, trying to convey, like, get them to understand, oh, and then sometimes it's new people, but uh, most of the time it all balances out and ever, it's just it's a lot of fun. The, the, the other nice thing about working with people we know is that I know their process. You know, they know how I work, but I know how they work. So somebody right. like, you know, Zach Farmer, um, he's not going to give me a whole lot of character when we're in the rehearsal hall. He's going to process stuff, he's going to take it all in, he's going to figure it out, and eventually he's going to give me this amazing detailed, fully formed character. But I know that I'm not going to get that early, and I'm fine with it, because I know what I get eventually will be wonderful. Right. There are other actors who bring a really full character pretty early, and they want to live with it for a long time, you know? Right. Um, and me knowing what they do, and what they need from me, and what they don't need from me, when I need to leave them alone, you know, that's all really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought this question could be slightly controversial, but I actually wait uh, for um, you mentioned that the show, <laughs> the show you know, it went to uh, off Broadway and it didn't work. Now, how do you feel New Line's production worked versus what they did? Like, how do you feel you've changed or you know reworked things to make it the production it should be versus what it was on Broadway? And it goes for direction, you know, costumes, music, all around. How do you feel things have worked? All right, you're asking me musical theater opinion. I'm gonna let loose. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, we we do a lot of shows that tank on broad on Broadway or off Broadway, um, and uh, ninety percent of the time, it's because the show was not treated well in New York. It was misunderstood. Um, that's not always the case. Uh, Hands on Hard Body didn't do well in New York, but I think it was was very well done. They, you know, I have no complaints about that. Uh, but like Cry Baby, High Fidelity were terribly done. In were horribly misunderstood and mistreated. Um, I don't think that's true for Heather's. I don't think it was a bad production whatsoever. But I, but I do think it, it was uh, mis, mis aimed. 
I think they were trying really hard to make it really funny. And a lot of it's already really funny, but some of it's really serious. And they really tried to get laughs during serious things. Like, like Martha's big song, Kindergarten Boyfriend. Um, it's got that line, I think it's right for the last verse, and a horse with wings. You know, that, that Martha really wanted a laugh out of off, off Broadway, which just horrifies me. <laughs> it's like, That's why on earth would you want to laugh there in this beautiful moment? Um, I, I think that they were trying to make it commercial. They were trying to make it tourist friendly. Mean Girls Musical is what they're trying to make. Well, and it's, that's not what Larry O'Keefe and Kevin Murphy wrote. Mm -hmm. They did not write a show that the tourists would like. You know, they wrote this incredibly aggressive, oppressive show, uh, which is exactly what we love. Um, so, I mean, I, I think in the case of Heather's, it was, it was really just about them trying to lighten it off Broadway. And, and for us saying, why on earth would we want to lighten this amazing piece of theater? So, so I think we embraced what was crazy and hilarious about it, but we also embraced what was devastating and poignant and shattering and all those other things. Um, and I, I think we just serve material better. You know, I mean, it, often people say to me, you know, what's your vision for this show or whatever? My vision is tell the story as clearly as we can possibly tell it. Make sure we understand the story and do it the, the best job we can in communicating that to an audience. Um, and in the case of Heather's, that takes us to some very serious, very dark places. And, I, and I, I think it's silly to avoid that. It's because it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? How do you feel about it? Well, you've heard a lot from him, but you're also a director. So how did this show work for you? Or how did, how did what was your process? Well, I, were, were you surprised that <laughs> we all were by the gravity of it over time? I, I, I mean, I was, I, I think it's hard to work. I wasn't surprised of the gravity because of how we kept saying, and how we kept telling the actors of that intensity, is, you know, the stakes are getting higher throughout the whole thing. So I think, I think, you know, maybe not seeing that it would go that fully, and we still thought maybe, you know, people would think a lot of it's funny. But as we worked it, and as everything went on, the actors did such a great job of really listening to that and saying the stakes are getting higher. Even if we don't know that these weren't suicides or whatever, like, you know, would they've been more freaked out knowing that there was a serial killer out there <laughs> murdering right. all of them, you know, and it's one of them. That could have been a different show entirely. But I just, them knowing the stakes for them, even though they're like, all these people are committing suicide, we saw that from that character. And it was just, for each one of them, it was different. And I think it just heightened all of it. Um, I think, I, yeah, I think that was really great. As far as the, off-Broadway, I, I saw what Scott said in, a lot, in that of they were trying to make it funny and it was, there was a lot of mugging and a lot of bringing it out to when it wasn't, then it, it wasn't kids being kids anymore. It wasn't this... It was kids trying to be funny. It was, right. They were doing a show. You know, it was, yeah, it, it becomes it presentational and for me that's never my favorite. You know, I would rather see two people fighting on a stage, nose to nose, like this, and not cheating out a little. Or like, you know, and that's something we all had to break. I don't know, I, for us, that, you know, when we went to school, what do they always yell at you? Cheat out, cheat out, cheat out whatever, cheat out, you know? And so starting working with Scott, that's one thing I really appreciated is because then it's not, we're telling the story for them, but we don't have to, here it is. You know, and that's what I love about it. It's you know, and it starts off lighter and funnier, and as we go on, it's, I mean, it is just a train to hell. I'll tell you what, I hated it when I listened to it. Hated it, hated it, hated it, hated it. And then I, I really did. I oh my god, it's awful. <laughs> I hated it. Um, and then seeing it and seeing what had happened and how it had been formed and what you guys had done and what all of you all had done was like. This is fun. This is fun. This sounds good. It's all there, and you can ask Daddy. I'm a wuss, but if I'm not, I don't, I'm not always a wuss. I was crying by the end of it. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. crying. I was, <laughs> I, and when I listened to it the first time, I was like, oh. well, and one of the things, to, to the actor's credit, um, one of the things from the very beginning, we kept saying, no cartoon characters. Mm -hmm. These are outrageous circumstances. These are outrageous events. It's not a cartoon. Right. And, and you've got to be as authentic and honest as you could possibly be 
within these array of circumstances, which is same as Little Shop and Cry Baby and Bad Boy and Urine Town, you know. Um, but to the credit of the cast, nobody in this cast gave us a cartoon character from the very beginning. Everybody was really working at making it honest, and I think that went a long way in making the show both um, engaging, like sucking the audience in in Act One, and then terrifying them in Act Two. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that really is a paradigm, though, with New Line and Approach. I did this in my seventh show, and I've and every single show, it's how can we tell the story, and you only put something up there if it if it furthers the story along. You don't embellish it. You don't add things to it. You don't change things. Everything's there for a reason, and only the things you need. Yeah, and, and I, I, always, I always say to the actors, if you uh, think of something that would be really funny to do, you have to discard it. If you think of something to do that will really reveal character and plot, have a go. Right. You don't do it just for the joke. You, the more real it is, it's... It, it, when it's funny, the realer it is, the funnier it is. Yeah, right, exactly. But you were talking about what, um, I mean, just from the characters, arguably Kurt and Rambo probably the comedic characters of the show, and Blue is freaking hilarious, given that they're trying to date with somebody. Um, <laughs> but you guys told Ooh. us, you said, don't try to play it drunkenly, just play it real, and all of a sudden it became ten times better, and I think that helped a lot. Right, because it's entirely about the two boys wanting sex. There's no nothing else going on, just that. Yeah. And that's awesome, and that's funny, because we all recognize that is true. But it's also in the, the idea of that they, they were probably doing something ridiculous, as boys do, with, to try to get them to do all this stuff. And in a musical, it comes out in song and a you know movement. But like, and I, I just I just love how unseductive. This right, is. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but going back to what Rob you just said about you only have the things that you need and whatever, and in the set it is perfect. I love seeing the counter come out of the stage over there and the bed over here. You know, our closet, the kitchen, and only seeing those certain. How did you pack all of that in there? Is what I right. thought when, when stuff was coming out, when all these different sets no were choice, coming out. Right? Well, that, that's the nature of a black box. And in fact, the cast has the same the same challenge. There's no backstage. There's no whim. There's no. I can't hide anything. You can't hide anything as a cast. It's all here. When you enter this room, you're on stage, and this stuff never leaves stage. It's always on stage. So I had to find ways to to manipulate it and and. Uh, there's good things and bad things about that. There's a certain magic about the fact that it just sort of flows into the next thing. You know, the bed just sort of slides out and it appears from nowhere. You flip something around and you've been looking at the whole show and all of a sudden, Veronica's hanging herself. Yeah. I mean, it's really cool. Um, that's, um, it's, you know, the nature of having to work in this kind of an environment, but it's also, pare it down. How can we execute those things and know where we're at uh, you know, with 7-Eleven, there were just a few key things. You had to have a cup dispenser, you had to have the snacks, and I wanted a slurping machine. Yeah. Because, but I didn't need to fill the whole story. Right. Uh, you don't need all that. Yeah. You just need enough to know. The kitchen, I need, you needed to have a sink, and you needed to have, because you had to get under the sink to get the drain cleaner, and you needed to have a kitchen cabinet to get the mugs out of, and, you know, your spices or whatever. Um, it's just enough to set the space, and set the scene and that's all you do that's it. but also the, the little things that turn and come out and all that I think there's nothing more awesome in theater than little surprises <laughs> audience loves little surprises and I think those who don't know what's going to happen they love the little surprises in the set it's, uh, I mean that's just you know, it's born of necessity yeah. well it's fun and it works it's great um, I also the band sounds amazing um, it's really great. It's really great that in you guys working with Ben and stuff like it, the it just it it just melds together so beautifully, and it really does. It sounds amazing. It's awesome music. Yeah, I'm always one too. I'm like, if it's a you know rock show, I want it to rock and I want it to be loud. But Scott always says no. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> uh, well, so, we always do rock musicals, right? right. The biggest challenge is the band has to sound like aggressive rock and roll and not be so loud that Ben has to feedback the mics. That's really hard. 
<laughs> it's really hard. For poor Clancy on drums, he can't turn the volume down the way the guitar and the bass can, you know, or the piano even. Um, so that is hard, but, but we do still get that energy out of the band, even though I'm constantly telling you that they're too loud. You know, though, one of the things, as much as the the ass as the staging was, putting the band in the corner like that with the two hard walls, and then putting the set, which is open behind, that's the one thing that, unless you're in the band, you don't really notice it, it's all open and behind, so that sound blends by bouncing off those walls, and about half of it goes under the set and gets muffled. And those are, it's because, some of that is because of, of that geometry that it helps to tone the band down so that it becomes more common. Yeah, Andrew's bass amp is literally underneath. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which, which, really, which really helps to keep it from blaring. It, but it also creates a good sound box. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 that, this show, better than any other, I can hear every single so clearly, I hear the bass so clearly, the guitar so clearly, um, and I, I don't know if that's a, a part of that geometry, but it, it's really not. I think it's also part of this, because the space is very live. Yeah, yeah, it's it's that crispness, I think, of the space. Yeah. It just sort of blends all of that together. On the next show, we're not thinking behind anything, right? That's no. <laughs> you are on stage. Exposed. But the next, now, next show. one is rock. What is rock? What is punk rock? Are they going to be too loud at any point? I'm not going to get puked on every night. <laughs> <laughs> but puked on by Larissa and Kamisha. I thought. It could be worse. It could be Zach puking on you. Oh, <laughs> actually, actually, I do have a plan for Clancy so, so that he, oh, yeah. he is controlled. He's suspended from the ceiling. That's correct. Please. Clancy, I have a No, with the way we're kind of jumping ahead, but with the way that it's laying out, there's a spot to kind of tuck him in, uh, which will help control and contain it. Um, well, and also, we could have done the show, too, without Miss Kimmy Short up there. Yes. This was, a, I thought, a very prop-heavy show for what, when, what we what specific. And we had, to, we had to make a lot of props this time. Yeah. We had to have the petition. Oh, right, the pig came out of it. It looks great. With the, side, with the glasses and the wig go on it, it's so funny. But Even though it's horrible. <laughs> it's What's funny. the inside of the ball made of? Um, four styrofoam blocks, and then I separated them with corrugated cardboard, and then wrapped, um, like, molded sculpting clay around the whole thing. And that I was love that thing. Yeah, it's so fun. cute. It's the cutest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> 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 so, so I'm on the phone with Kimmy one night. We're trying to figure out what should the phone <coughs> look like. She's like, do you want like sticks of TNT? I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not what this thing is. And I was like, well, they tell us it's a Norwegian bomb, right? So we're on the phone. I start looking up the internet. And she's like, don't look that up on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You just did a bunch of research about the KKK. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 yeah. Nobody can come back with me yet, though. So. Scott, they're they're listening. Listening. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The FBI's going to be knocking on your door. Yes. <laughs> like, come on in. It's all show dudes. Well, once you figure out we need a real burger, I'm out for the next show. Wow. Well, anyway, thank you guys so much for joining <laughs> us. Um, it's been a blast. This is a great show, and it was a great first show in here, and for the 25th and the 7th show, whatever. It's and great. also really good. Yeah, it's great. Great new home. Thank you all so much for being in it and doing stuff.